Okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And take two of the six-game main slate that we have here on Monday. Looks like the first recorded one um, didn't come through with any audio. So uh, I think I have that fixed. Just a setting that got randomly reset on me. Um, so let's try and keep it short here. Uh, the first one was about... You know, an hour or whatever, um, we've got projections and ownership loaded to the side already, of course, as always. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so keep an eye out for pushes throughout the day as some things will change. Starting to see some some steam come in on, you know, a really, really cheap Blake Snell. You know, relative to his last several outings. Super cheap. Excuse me. Um, yeah, but plenty of playable arms up here. Now, you can play Mitch Keller. This isn't... This isn't horrible at all against Dodgers. Um, of course, some of these other guys have better matchups, right? But uh, they're certainly not 10% owned. So, um, you know, we can go uh, to a lot of different spots here down on the cheap end. A couple of these guys are in play as well. So let's just get into it real quick um, and see if we can keep this short and sweet. Tyler Wells and Domingo Herman in Yankee Stadium tonight. Um, I haven't checked out any weather or anything. We might have to keep an eye out for this. Uh, I'm just going to go over things as if, um, you know, there were no weather concerns whatsoever. I think Tyler Wells would be in play at 7,700. I really love the arsenal here. A really equitable five-pitch mix. Um, doesn't walk people. The problem, however, with Tyler Wells is that he's got a homer problem, pretty serious homer problem, 5% five, uh, 5 homer rate and um, an 11.5% uh, barrel rate. So that that's a big issue. He gives up 36-37% hard contact to the right side of the plate. Not so much in average, right? So it's you're going to be homer hunting uh, against Tyler Wells. He doesn't get blown apart all that regularly. He's a heavy fly ball pitcher. Um, and mostly it's just going to be, you know, kind of a bloop and a blast type of stuff that really tears him apart. He's got an 85% strand right here. So we're looking in the future for a few more of these bloop in a blast type of plays. Um, does have a 320 ERA with a 415 XFIP here. So a full run's worth of regression. This is a super low batting average allowed given how much hard contact he's pitching to and how much power he does give up to the right side in particular. Uh, good swing and miss, though, of course. Average strikeout rate to the righties, but well above average to the lefties this year. That's about six, seven ticks above average two left-handed hitters. So if you want to get good thing for the Yankees, they're mostly right-handed heavy. So that's why I think the Yankees are also in play. It would probably be mostly short stacks, but this is a six game slate. You can pretty much play whoever you want here. Um, and you can, you can stack literally every single team and you could play pretty much every single pitcher. Um, you know, there are arguments to play absolutely everybody in one respect or another here tonight. And the Yankees certainly qualify. Price adjusted, they're very cheap. 49 for Glavers, not so much cheap. And 45 for Stanton, it's kind of an average price tag there for him. But everybody else is well under 4000 including Anthony Rizzo. We always like him from the left side of the plate against a righty at Yankee Stadium, despite the very high strikeout rate for Tyler Wells and the lower power number, uh, 159 ISO to the lefties. Nobody's going to really hit for average all that regularly, as we mentioned. So um, it's mostly fly ballers and or line drivers, right? And, and guys with some pop from the left, excuse me, from the right side. But you can always play Rizzo. He has been struggling quite tremendously recently, but he's at a 3,800 um, first base play on a six-game slate. That's a fine price tag to get to, I think. They're only going to have probably two or three lefties in the lineup. So that's what would make full Yankee stacks fully playable. However, Baltimore's got a pretty damn good bullpen here. And I don't generally like stacking against either of these bullpens, frankly. That's really one of the sole reasons that the Yankees, despite their drastically underperforming offense, uh, are really eight games over 500 here. So it's their bullpen. Same thing with Baltimore. Um, you know, their offense is quite a bit more capable and and deadly than uh, the Yankees, especially against right-handed pitching, right? They create about an eight clip, um, you know, more uh, efficiently, I should say, right? Every other number is mostly similar, right? Similar ground ball to fly ball ratio, similar hard contact ratios. They get on base a little bit more and hit for a little bit less power. But, you know, this ISO number for the Yankees at 175 is mostly buoyed by Judge, who is out still. So uh, every... 
every metric here outside of the raw batting average, which is a notable tick and a half difference, it's pretty much the same for both of these offenses. However, the Orioles have guys that steal bases, um, and they are actually healthy uh, for the most part. They've got all of their good hitters healthy and in the lineup here. Um, so I think both offenses here are in play, targeting Domingo Hormon on the other side at 7,200. Uh, well, he just threw a perfect game, and you guys know that I really like shorting guys and fading them after they come off of a uh, or coming off of a career outing. So, um, not super thrilled about playing him necessarily at 7,200. Sorry if you can hear my fan in the background; it's a little uh, a little warm here today. Um, 7,200, not super jacked about playing playing him in a difficult matchup offensively. Uh, I do like the ownership. Because he's got a, an elite curveball changeup mix here, where he really leaves it on the table for me is a, a quite below average four seamer and just a break even two seamer. So he mains this curveball and tries to. I mean, this is 60% of the arsenal here with the curveball change. So um, he does give up a little bit of pop also and some fly balls. That's his four seamer sort of breaking pitch kind of kind of lean that gives him the fly balls. Uh, and the hard contact is there for Herman as well. If we're targeting an offense, price adjusted, it's got to be the Yankees, of course, against Tyler Wells. But full stack wise, I think we have to target the Orioles. They're just more potent top to bottom than the Yankees. And I think this is a better spot top to bottom for them. Domingo Herman still with a 190X ISO, 223 ISO allowed to the righties with a 186 ISO allowed to the lefties. Hard contact, as I mentioned, with some fly balls. So both arms playable due to their price tags in this particular matchup because both of these offenses overall are just kind of break even. However, both offenses certainly very much in play due to the short slate um, and the fundamental spots. These guys give up homers and they give up fly balls. This is at Yankee Stadium. So I think we can get to some offense here um, as kind of a, a little bit of a down the board stack. Uh, really on both sides for Baltimore and the Yankees. Let's move on to Atlanta and Cleveland. Uh, Bryce Elder on the mound. Unfortunately, he's down at 8,100 now. And, um, you know, we didn't really get the opportunity to short him up when, you know, when he was well above 10,000 or anything like that. Um, but he did have a couple of stinkers. We've been talking, I mean, I've been fading the guy for, you know, going well on a month now. Hasn't really worked out because he's had some really damn good matchups. For the most part, this is another really good matchup, at least suppression-wise, uh, for him against the Guardians. However, I've still got question marks. He's got an 85% strand rate. This number is too high. It's not sustainable. We've talked about this several diff several times uh, over the last few weeks. Um, now, over these large samples, yeah, it's sustainable over 100 innings or whatever. But 200 and 500 and 600, you know, a full career, this number is not sustainable. So we're going to see this tick down. It could be slowly. And in most scenarios, it's likely to be slowly with Bryce Elder because he does still have ground ball equity here, in particular against the right side. Now, over the last month or so, this was hovering at about four and even north of four ground balls per fly ball. This is ticking down quite precipitously. It's all the way down to three and a half now. Now, that's still a, you know, astronomically high number, right? Top 1% in ground ball rate in all of baseball. But it's it's downtrending. And we've talked about that. So how, that's how this is likely to, you know, the regression is likely to set in. He has a, an ERA of two and a half with an XFIP, a run and a half higher than that. So with the very high strand rate and batted ball metrics with hard contact here, still at 37%, suggesting that we could see more regression come to him. Um, you know, certainly in the batting average, he's running hot about a tick, tick and a half. You got a 246 XBA with an average, you know, batting average allowed. Uh, of 227 here so running a little hot there same thing in the woba department a little bit closer um and same thing in the iso so overall he's he's very serviceable because he's got good ground ball stuff but in this particular matchup he's going to be a little bit more susceptible this is far more this line against left-handed hitters is far more closer or far closer i should say to um you know, a league average traditional platoon split in that he's got, you know, a buck 30 ground ball to fly ball, 20% line drive rate. The The issue here against lefties in particular is that the strikeout rate is sub 20%. The soft contact is 13% with 34% hard. So he's giving up medium plus and hard contact here still to the left side with a 150 ISO. You know, this is not a horribly 
elevated figure or anything, but it is definitely attackable. Um, with Cleveland in particular, a couple of these guys, they're still going to hit a lot of ground balls. Let's not get it confused, right? This is still Cleveland. They have a 123 aggregate ISO because they have two guys, basically, that can hit the baseball out of the ballpark. 25% hard contact rate. They're not going to strike out, however, and I think that depresses the upside for Bryce Elder in this particular matchup a little bit more uh, for suppression and to run deeper into a game. Excuse me. At 8100 I think the price tag is fine. And the ownership here is is very attractive at 6%. However, the price tag and combined with the early projection here and the value score uh, really kind of raised some red flags for me. And the fundamental analysis here, I think, kind of backs that up a little bit. Um, now, he's not going to walk people, and he's going to stay off of the barrel. However, I mean, these are technical barrels, but, you know, I don't care who you are. You're going to have 37% hard contact. That is loud contact, whether it's technically a barrel or not. I think this is attackable with a couple of pieces from the Guardians over here. They're just kind of middling so far in value, mostly because they're cheap. We'll talk about that with a few teams today. But they've got a couple of guys that can get into um, you know, get into a ground ball, hit, ground ball pitcher over here, like Bryce Elder, notably Jose Ramirez, and Josh Naylor, who can't get to baseball in the air. Now, everybody else not really going to hit for any power whatsoever. Steven Kwan, at least from the left side. Um, Andres Jimenez, Josh Bell, maybe a little bit of power. <clears throat> and But most of them are, are still going to hit the baseball on the ground. Now, to the right side where we want to attack the hard contact figure, I mean, they're probably going to only have two righties in the lineup. So that plays into Elder's favor a little bit just because of the ground ball rate, not necessarily because of the hard contact, right? But he only gives up so far at 090 ISO to the righties. Um, I just have upside concerns for him. At the price tag, I think there is upside for suppression to run seven innings and not give up anything or give up one maybe. And that could still serve as a uh, an equitable outing for him tonight. And this is only a six-game slate. You could, as I mentioned earlier, you could play whoever the hell you want. He's certainly in play in a down strikeout matchup, but a plus suppression matchup because Cleveland is bad overall. Um, Gavin Williams on the mound for the Guardian, 6,300. He's probably one of the few guys I'm going to leave on the shelf today. I don't like the projection, of course. He gets Atlanta over here. This this offense is impossible to go after right now. Uh, you could be one of the better arms in baseball, like a Joe Ryan, for example, who we'll talk about in the next game, and, and still give up six runs in three innings. It's every damn one of these guys that's hitting the baseball over the wall now, um, and they've been doing it for a month, going on a month and a half here. They're all mega expensive, which is going to keep their aggregate ownership down. You know, on full slates, they've been very serviceable in that respect because they can jump on arms, and really they don't create offense outside of hitting the baseball out. But when they get into these modes, uh, you got to kind of just eat the price tags. you got to hop on board because they're all seeing the baseball, and you can't really avoid it. Right, it, it's every night where Acuna is either hitting two balls out or he's stealing two bases. He stole another two yesterday. Um, he's 66 at the top. That's underpriced for him relative to where he should be. He should, he is probably he and Otani right now are the couple of guys that should be at 7,000. Um, you know, but I digress. The Ozzy Albie's 59. Austin Riley's 58 now. Matt Olson 64. Sean Murphy 54. The guys down at the bottom half, Ozuna, Rosario, Arcias, who is an all-star somehow, uh, Michael Harris as well, they are all you know, 4, 000, mid 4,000s, just about, so they don't make it all that much cheaper for you, which is going to keep the ownership down for Atlanta. But this is a super young arm, even though Gavin Williams has a really good outing against Kansas City, like the Braves are not Kansas City, right? And this is still a very young arm. I do like the early uh, distribution in the usage here with the four-seamer slider curveball change. Can't really take much out of the values, of course, because he's got just the two starts. But this is Atlanta. I do really, really like the 74% strike one rate. If he's going to survive, that's how he's going to be able to do it. He has to get ahead of hitters. We'll go on a little bit of a rant about strike one and getting ahead of hitters here in a couple of games. Um, good chase so far and a fine CSW. However, you know, this is a, a real young arm and one of the best offenses in baseball. Um, you know, I still keep them up there with the Dodgers and Tampa, but it's really hard to argue that they're not the most potent. They can beat any arm in baseball, and Gavin Williams certainly qualifies as any arm in baseball. So if you want to go after 
Atlanta, I mean, I really don't. But like I said, it, he's cheap, and he is one of the guys here in the 6K range that can make other expensive stacks for you. Uh, and contrarian builds happen. Uh, so for the most part, I'm just going to leave him on the shelf. I thought it was a good matchup against Kansas City. We talked about that a little bit, about going right back to him. But he's more expensive now, and the matchup is far, far worse. So no thanks. Uh, I'm just going to stay off of this and get to probably mostly offense in this game. I'll have some Elder because I do like the ownership. Getting a little bit of leverage on him is not too difficult to do, but this is a terrible strikeout matchup. And like I said, I do have questions about upside. Okay, here are the Kansas City Royals. Austin Cox going on the mound for them against the Twins. 5,000. I mean, Cox, I, we talked about him and his last start. Um, he did get Cleveland, as a matter of fact, and he got picked apart a little bit, gave up four runs in like three and two-thirds. But he walked four batters, so he didn't really do himself any favors. Um, I think he's in play here against the Twins at 5,000. Mostly it's because of 5,000 and, you know, 2.5% ownership. But it's also sort of corroborated by the Minnesota Twins left-handed pitching matchup. 26.5% K rate, 218 batting average for the Twins in, you know, nearing 700 or 800 PAs, I should say. Uh, on the full season, 85 WRC plus. This team stinks against left-handed pitching. 154 ISO, 34% hard, sure, and a neutral ground ball to fly ball, sure. But they're going to pop up a lot of balls here, and they don't really get on base or create offense. They don't have anybody that steals bases. Correa is actually striking out a lot this season compared to his career numbers. Buxton obviously strikes out and stinks. Um, you know, Kyle Farmer, Willie Castro, these guys will will whiff a little bit. They did just call up Jose Miranda who's got um, a lower strikeout figures historically, but he was not great earlier in the season. Hope, hopefully his numbers in the minors will, or since he's been sent down, um, will translate now that he's called back up. Um, these guys are playable, definitely, because they're going to platoon very heavily against Cox. However, I'm attracted to the real equitable distribution, similar to uh, Gavin Williams, um, against the Braves for a young arm, I really like this when you're very spread out and you've got three or even four pitches. At 5,000, I think that puts him in play. Now, the Twins are going to be the most popular stack today, um, and it probably won't be all that close. So I think you, if you want to play it this way, instead of trying to get leverage with your pitchers, you could try and get leverage with, uh, well, with the pitcher, but against the most popular offense as well. That's certainly another way you can do it. Um, now, we do have to keep an eye out for the control issues, right? This is a bullpen arm. Some of these numbers are going to be noisy because they're mostly um, they're, they're mostly set-up situations, right, for a bullpen arm coming in and, and trying to manage plus matchups. Um, so we got to keep an eye out for, like, the walk rate, for example, and the barrel rate. That does obviously put these guys from the Twins in play because there's still some guys that will make some barrels. Uh, Carlos Correa, Byron Buxton, notably, right? Kyle Farmer, he can barrel baseball a little bit. He's 2,400 dual eligibility in the middle of the lineup, right? Several of these guys are mega cheap. So it's a combination of a decent fundamental spot and the price tags for the Twins here that's really popping their ownership. But I think that Austin Cox has to be in play. If you want to full stack Atlanta and get to each, of, each one of the top five guys all in the same lineup, you have to play somebody down here. You have to punt both of your starting pitchers and your secondary stack as well in order to make that happen. So Austin Cox, I think that has to put him in play in a build like that, and it's completely off the board, and nobody is going to have that. We do have depth concerns, of course, and you know run suppression concerns because they're going to platoon heavily. But I do like the equitable four-pitch mix here. I think that is going to keep him in play and put him in play for maybe a full five innings here, and I think that's fine at 5,000. He could pop for 16, 18 points, against the Twins, and I don't think that is going to completely take you out of play here in tournaments tonight. Joe Ryan on the mound for the Twins, 10,000 for him. Um, yeah, like, sign me up. I don't really care that he gave up six runs in the last start against Atlanta. That's Atlanta. 30% ownership. I actually am fine with this. I think he's probably under-owned relative to the upside that he offers in this particular matchup, and I think he's kind of underpriced. In the last several starts for him, we've seen him well above 10,000, and the matchup hasn't been near as good. Yeah, he got picked apart really good by Detroit, gave up six earned in seven innings, um, but still struck out seven, right? Struck out nine in that complete game shutout against Boston. That was really his best outing over the last you know two months or so, but he's had some difficult matchups, right? In Atlanta, he had Boston, who he tore apart. 
had Detroit. Okay, yeah, he just didn't have his stuff that day. But then he had Toronto, he had Cleveland, he had Houston, right? He had the Angels. Not the most excellent slate here for Joe Ryan to uh, really navigate. Kind of a gauntlet. And the Kansas City Royals certainly do not qualify as the same sort of caliber team. They strike out a lot more than all of those teams, and they don't hit for any power. They don't get to baseball in the air all that regularly. There's a slightly above hard contact here, uh, above average, I should say, at 34%. But in aggregate, just 140 ISO with a 24.5% K rate, 79 WRC+. plus. Now, the twin, or excuse me, the Royals are actually popping a little bit here in value aggregate value scores today. But it's not because it's a super equitable spot. Joe Ryan does give up a little bit of pop to the right-handers. 193 ISO allowed. He's got a 32% K rate, though. 35% hard contact with a lot of fly balls. 055 ground ball to fly ball. That's how he's attackable. It's mostly because he's only got two pitches here. He's got a bad slider. I don't really want to go into it. I did in the first vid, unfortunately. Uh, I ranted about having two pitches or more than two pitches. There's only one guy in baseball, that, or two if you want to consider Strider, that's been able to sustain over a large sample equitable numbers with only two pitches, and that guy's Jacob deGrom. He's got a fastball, and he's got a slider, but he throws 102 miles an hour, and he's got a 94-mile-an-hour slider. Joe Ryan doesn't throw that hard. He's got elite four-seam command. He's got an elite split change. But he doesn't have any equitable swing and miss to the opposite side, right? If this elite split change is so damn good, where's the swing and miss to the left-handers, right? And where's the slider value, right? If he's one of the most elite pitchers in baseball. I don't want, like I said, don't want to go too deeply into it, trying to keep this short-ish. But this slider is bad. You cannot give up five outs to the field on a 13% usage pitch here and expect to not get picked apart every so often. And that's really what's been happening. Good team or bad team, Detroit it is who I'm thinking of at the moment. Um, they will pick you apart if they only have to zero in on two pitches. Same thing with Strider. We've seen that a couple of times this year. You are susceptible if you only have a fastball and one secondary pitch. So that's the one wart for Joe Ryan, but I don't particularly care. His four-seamer and splitter are good enough still to pick through the Royals at, like I said, what I think is an underpriced 10000 and an under-owned 32% ownership here relative to everybody else on the slate. Uh, I think he's far and away the best arm, um, considering fundamental spot and fundamentals for him as well. And I think the, the price tag it, and the ownership are both playable figures also. So I think everybody is pretty much in play here. Uh, outside of mostly the Royals, I don't really want anything to do with this. I might have a hedge piece here or there, like a Bobby Witt, Salvi Perez. But the guys in that are popping the most in value score are not those two guys, right? It's all of the cheap guys. So you often see that with their projection relative to their price tag, they pop in value, but it's just because they're cheap. It's not necessarily because they're popping at a super, super um, you know, equitable fundamental spot because this is admittedly a, a pretty bad spot. He does give up fly balls and will get on a line occasionally. So a couple of these righties, maybe a cheap Michael Garcia, could keep him in play, Eddie Oliveras or something like that. If you want to full stack him, go ahead. You're going to get leverage. But not my favorite personally here tonight. I'm just going to stick with uh, the Twins. Mostly pitching here in this game, I think, for me. I'll have Twins, of course, because you could very easily get blown out. Uh, because the Royals are a bad baseball team over here, man. They are, what, 34 games under 500? Not even at the break yet? Are you kidding me? Um Okay, let's move on. But that's kind of where I stand so far on the Royals and the Twins. Angels, Padres, Jaime Berea on the mound. He got picked apart a little bit in his last start by the White Sox, uh, which is kind of surprising because the White Sox are garbage. Um, But Jaime Berea is just an average arm for the most part. He's also similar to Austin Cox in that most of his outings have come from the bullpen this year. He's got 12 full appearances. Does have five starts, but he's been pretty limited in those starts, right? Four innings. He went three in his last because he gave up six earned runs or five earned or whatever the hell it was um, against White Sox. For the most part, just a a pretty average arm. Um, He does have a little bit of upside at this particular price tag. We talked about this in his last start. Even at 6,800 where he was against Chicago, he was in play relative to everybody else. Same sort of deal here today. At 5,500, if you want to get to the more expensive stacks, you have to you have to make one of these decisions. You just can't make it happen otherwise. And he is in play against the Padres. However, he wouldn't be my favorite, of course, because this is the Padres. It's still a very difficult matchup for him, even though creation-wise this season, they're just a 96 WRC+. Plus. 
They have an 11.5% walk rate with a 23% K rate. The power number starting to tick up a little bit as we've gotten here deeper into the summer, and Juan Soto has started heating up a little bit. Um, this is still a very hard team to get through, even though they don't hit for a lot of batting average. They walk, low batting average, but they will hit for some power, and they got a couple of a guy here or there, you know, notably Tatis, maybe a Bogarts occasionally, Soto occasionally that will swipe a bag. Um, difficult matchup for Jaime Berea here. He is in play if you want to play a bounce and expect him to go maybe four or five innings and, and not get totally blown apart. Um, we've been able to attack the Padres this season with some right-handers on occasion. Uh, it's not super regular, but it's been in play. So he is in play at the price tag and certainly at a 3% ownership rate. But fundamentally, you're going to want to probably stay away from this. Gives up a little bit of pop to the right-handers, and Padres is going to go pretty right-handed heavy here. They're expensive. It's going to keep their ownership kind of middling and down a bit. But, um, you know, both sides are in play, I, I think, for sure. Blake Snell, he, here's the guy that I want to talk about uh, strike one with. Now, I went on a, a really, really long rant, you know, a good maybe 10, 15 minutes um, about Blake Snell and throwing strike one. And his last several starts, are, are like, are you ready for this? In his last four starts alone, 10 strikeouts, 11, 12, and 12 strikeouts. In the last, in these last four starts, he's gone six, 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 and seven innings, and he has a 49.5% strikeout rate. He's seen, I believe, 91 hitters, and he has 45 Ks. That is elite tier. And the only reason he's been able to do it, it's not just because of the really good value on the change up the slider and the curveball. That Those have been elite all season. It's because he's throwing strike one. He doesn't walk people when he gets ahead and counts, and it allows him to work to plus off speed and plus breaking stuff. And when he can do that, he's, over the last several starts, or over his last six, when he's really started this run... He's been upwards of 65 and 70% strike one. If he does that, he is a top five arm in baseball. His control, I mean, it it just, it's a total transformation for Blake Snell when he gets ahead of hitters. I'll leave it up to you guys to do a little bit more research on how big of a deal strike one is, but I've harped about this literally all season. This is the most important pitch in baseball. It's not a good four-seamer, right? It's not a great off-speed ghost fork or any of this garbage, okay? It's strike one. You have to be able to get ahead of hitters because it allows you to dictate where you want to go in counts. And if you have plus breaking stuff and plus off-speed stuff, it doesn't matter if you have a league average fastball. It doesn't matter if you have elite 103-mile-an-hour velocity. If you get ahead... The batting average and production numbers against you when you are ahead in the count are drastically different. So that's the one key for Blake Snell. We talked about this uh, ad nauseum in his last start as well. Um, now, what's going to take us off here today is number one, okay, he's at a super cheap price tag. That's inflating his ownership here a little bit. This is a bad matchup, okay? The Angels have Anthony Rendon back, who doesn't strike out at all. Now, even though Trout and Otani do strike out. Trout is striking out at a 30% clip. Otani will whiff at a 27% clip against lefties or whatever. Anthony Rendon has a 13% strikeout rate over his career. He gives those two protection. So when they are not striking out and getting on base, they hit for a lot of power, right? It's doubles a lot of the time. So it's Anthony Rendon doesn't really need to hit for a lot of power because he's hitting so much more regularly with runners in scoring position. Taylor Ward doesn't strike out, just a 20% clip. Trout and Otani there up at the top of the lineup. These guys can create runs, and that makes it super dangerous for a left-handed pitcher. Like, Otani is left-handed, but or he hits from the left side, but we don't really care about that. He's Otani. 110 WRC plus here and just a 22% K rate. This number will go down in aggregate now that Anthony Rendon is back in the middle of the lineup. Hunter Renfro, just a 20% K rate. Eddie Escobar, 20% K rate against lefties this season. Luis Renjifo hits lefties pretty well from the right side, as does Chad Wallach. David Fletcher doesn't strike out. Okay, so this makes it a super difficult lineup for Blake Snell to go after. They've got some patient hitters. Trout obviously still walks a lot, a lot and should, so does Shohei Otani. So that plays into their favor a little bit more as well. So we got to keep in mind that even though Blake Snell has been fantastic, don't get me wrong, I absolutely love the changes. Throwing more strike one, like you don't need 
38% chase like Joe Ryan at 40% chase like Joe Ryan has when you have 65 and 70% strike one with elite secondary offerings like this, right? This will put you at a 36% CSW, and you could blow through absolutely any lineup in baseball. It's not that. He has to get ahead of hitters, and then the walk rate tanks. The barrel rate comes down because he gets to throw his secondary offerings in plus counts, and the ISO numbers, literally every metric is far, far better. However, he's 45% owned. Okay, He's at a, what I would consider you know, a cheap enough price tag to consider this a trappy price. He's got an 82% strand rate, and he does still have some a little bit of regression coming to him with a 320 ERA with an XFIP and ERA suggesting a little bit northward of that. Hard contact is still above 33% here, pushing 34%. It's elevated, right? 224 XBA, 315 XWOBA, those are fine numbers. 168 XISO, that's attackable a little bit with a very good offense over here and one that doesn't strike out nearly as much as you would think. You're going to need a lot from Blake Snell here, and despite the very equitable six pass starts for him, he's got an entire career suggesting that he has very serious problems throwing strike one and walking people. So uh, I want to be careful with this. you got to have exposure when he's streaking like this because uh, he's really feeling it on the mound. But you got to be careful, too, because this could be a blow-up spot for him against a very dangerous lineup. So I think both sides have to be really in play, really everybody, uh, to be quite honest. All right, we yapped about that a little bit. Let's get to Seattle and San Francisco. Brian Wu, 6,600, 15%. I like this. I think this is fine. Um, Giants strike out, man, and he's got a little bit of whiff stuff in the tank here. Oh, we got a short sample, and he, he struck out, what, uh, 25 hitters or something, you know, of the, the 60 right-handers that he's seen this year, that's not going to persist, right? A full 39% K rate, it's a little aggressive. But he does still have a 30% soft contact rate to the righties with a 27% hard contact rate. That's very attractive, right? He doesn't walk anybody. 6% walk rate so far with a 7% barrel rate, super attractive. 67% strike one. Five starts, but equitable, you know, converging stats here, um, in the early going, plate discipline metrics. 35% chase is elite. 13% strikeout rate, or swinging strike rate, I should say, is elite. 29% CSW for what was a double A arm, pretty damn good so far. And this game is also in 60 degree weather in San Francisco at night. So I'm okay playing Brian Wu here. And at sub 15%, I think this number is a bit too low. I think you can squeeze out a little bit of leverage on the field here, depending on how you structure the rest of your teams. This is just a six-game slate, so you're going to have to, you know, take some stands somewhere. I think 6,600 is a playable price tag here. we got to keep an eye out. He's better against the righties, more susceptible against the lefties with a more traditional platoon split, 382 ISO in a short sample to the lefties, right? 523 Woba. Okay, we got to be careful here because he doesn't have a changeup. He needs a swing and miss pitch. That is not a swing and miss type of pitch like the slider that just tails over the, the barrel a lot of the time. Two opposite-handed hitters. Throws a two-seamer a good bit, so that will make him susceptible to left-handed hitters. And unfortunately for him, like Tyro Estrada got hit in the wrist yesterday. He probably will be out tonight. So they may have seven lefties in the lineup tonight, which could take you off a little bit in terms of upside and strikeout stuff. But I'm okay eating it on a six-game slate here. You just got to take some chances. And the Giants still going to strike out a lot. They haven't seen Brian Wu. And still just a short book on him and just the five starts in the majors here. So I think you can go after him. Uh, and, and play some. If you want to have some left-handed San Francisco pieces, um, you know, on the other side, I think that's fine. You'll play Lamont Wade. He's dealing with a little bit of a side or oblique issue. Jock Peterson, fine against every righty in baseball. Uh, Patty Bailey, he's got great numbers this year. Blake Sable is also capable, um, you know, sec or catcher and outfield dual eligibility piece as well. So keep an eye out for some of these lefties. Probably, you know, one-off pieces or short stacks would be my favorite going after Brian Wu, but mostly Wu on the mound for me for the Mariners. Logan Webb on the mound for the Giants, and mostly him for me as well. 30% ownership, I think this is fine. It's another pretty decent pivot to get off of some of the Blake Snell. Um, if you want, we'll get to, you know, in the next game, another guy that you can pivot with. 9,200, though, I think he's pretty underpriced. Uh, for this particular matchup, the Mariners against right-handed pitching, 99 WRC plus, 26% K rate, that's below average, 9% walk rate to average, 160 ISO, 32% hard, neutral ground ball to fly ball, 305 Woba, 
All this is average. The 225 batting average, though, this is Padres territory, not average, right? It's one of the worst numbers in baseball against right-handed pitching. So I think you can get to Logan Webb over his last little while. He's been struggling a little bit trying to find it. Haven't been able to realize a lot of the upside with him recently. He got picked apart by Toronto in the last outing. Liked him in that spot. Still struck out five, but did give up five runs and sprayed eight hits, and that's Toronto. This is Seattle, strikes out far more and produces way less against right-handed pitching. This is also, you know, he's throwing in San Francisco in a night game as well uh, in 60-degree weather, just like Brian Wu. So, yeah, sign me up. Um, I'm perfectly fine mixing in him at this particular projection and this ownership figure. I mean, this is a strong value score, 35 here for anybody north of 9,000. You get him above 30 in the value score, it's pretty equitable. Um, he's got elite ground ball stuff still, top 1% in ground ball rate, and he's still got swing and miss despite the last you know six, eight starts or so where it's been you know, sub 1K per inning. All the plate discipline numbers are great, though, outside of the low swinging strike rate. We would like to see him induce a little bit more, that, but it's mostly because he's throwing a two-seamer. It's just not the swing and miss pitch. That's the ground ball pitch for him. Um, so I'm fine playing Logan Webb here tonight. I think this is a fine 22 to 25 point outing. He's got 30 in the tank, definitely. Uh, and anything north of 25 points on the mound for you could be pretty damn serviceable, I think. I'm probably going to leave most of the Mariners on the shelf here. I don't like the spot for them, and I don't like the ballpark or the weather or any of that nonsense. If you want to play a lefty here or there, um, you know, it would be like a, a Cal Raleigh or a Jared Kelnick or something like that. Jared Kelnick in particular... Maybe a J.P. Crawford, their their skill sets will play up a little bit in this ballpark. Uh, Cal Raleigh, you're just hoping he's going to hit a, a baseball out uh, and into McCovey Cove. I think that's fine at 4,300, getting a little bit of leverage on the field here against Logan Webb's 30% ownership. Outside of that, I don't particularly want to play Julio. The big ballpark, though, for him, and he can you know hit a ball in triples alley and run forever for sure. Tay Oscar, not so much. At, uh, I like the price tag, 3500 but he swings and misses a crap load. And he has a high barrel rate, which Logan Webb does not really give up. So um, not super thrilled about that, but everybody, everybody it, is in play on a six-game slate. Mostly pitching here in this game for me, but you can get to a couple of offensive pieces. Okay, let's get to the last game, Pittsburgh and the Dodgers. Mitch Keller, 8800 Um, Yeah, this is another guy in the same range. He's 200 more expensive, and he's a quarter of the ownership of Blake Snell. So, sure. The unfortunate, you know, situation for him is he gets Dodgers on the other side. Um, now, Keller's been struggling a little bit recently over his last couple of starts. We talked about him perhaps starting to figure it out a little bit and normalizing. He had some really varying outings. You know, he got picked apart by Oakland. Um, you know, he gave up five runs in five and a third. He got beat to shreds by Seattle, six earned in six innings. You know, the, the strikeout stuff hasn't totally evaporated, right? So that's still there. If he can suppress, then that's what puts him really in play because the strikeout stuff has never really waned, right? Even in this down stretch, ever since that, I mean, if you want to call it the Arizona outing at the end of May, Start with the Seattle outing when he started really giving up production. He still struck out 8-8-1 eight, eight, against Oakland. He just didn't have it there. 7-7-5-5. Seven, seven, five, and five. That's at a K in inning in every single one or, or better in every single one of those outings. This is the Dodgers, however. They don't strike out a lot. They walk a lot. Not necessarily a problem with Mitch Keller anymore. But it's the control um, that the Dodgers exhibit at the plate. They do not beat themselves. This is a super, super dangerous lineup it, it's because of the walk rate, right? They're very, very patient. They make you throw strikes, and they make you throw it over the plate. What would take me off Mitch Keller here as a really nice pivot, of course I love the ownership pivot, right? I think the projection is fine here. Value score is still fine for somebody in this mid-8K range on a six-game slate. What would take me off is that the secondary arsenal is not great. Doesn't have a changeup, and you're going to need a changeup when you go after the Dodgers, because they will platoon heavily against you, and they're all pretty damn good left-handed hitters. Certainly Freddie Freeman, Max Muncy maybe not so much. Um, and not anymore. He's hitting sub-200 with a 35 or 40% strikeout rate, whatever it is. But even still, you need a, an off-speed pitch in order to keep these guys off of balance. Max Muncy's still going to walk 15% clip, right? He's still very patient, even though he kind of stinks. Um it's the slider and the curveball. It's really leaving it on the table for me. He needs a little bit more swing and miss. He's only got a 9% swinging strike rate. Similar to Logan Webb, like he gets ground balls, right? Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. Doesn't give up a lot of hard contact. 
So he suppresses well in that respect, but I need some more called stri- or swinging strikes out of him in order to get super excited about playing him in a really, really down matchup against the Dodgers here. So I think you have to just side with the Dodgers because it's the Dodgers, but they're expensive, and this is a down matchup relative to the rest of the league. Mitch Keller is still an above-average arm. Uh, this kind of reminds me of the spot for like Pablo Lopez earlier in the year when um, you know I kind of touted that Pablo Lopez was a, a decent play against the Dodgers. I think it's a kind of similar spot for Mitch Keller, even though the Arsenals are different, yeah, you know, whatever. I think it's a, excuse me, a, a similar um, type of spot in that, you know, he's still a good arm, and he still has good swing and miss in aggregate, but it's a very dangerous matchup, and if he doesn't have his elite stuff here, this is one of the few teams that you cannot make mistakes against, uh, because they will make you pay. So, um I'll, I'll, I'm going to have some Mitch Keller for sure because I love the changes that he's made this season. The cutter and the, and the two-seamer are just absolutely fantastic. But I need more out of the off-speed and the breaking stuff to get super thrilled about playing him in really down matchups against the best teams in baseball. Uh, on, on the other side for the Dodgers, Michael Grove here, 5,300. The price tag puts him in play. Um, now, we got some shenanigans. It might be Kershaw tonight. I, I really doubt it. He actually pulled himself out of that game. I know I tilted him because Dave Roberts... Um, seemingly yanked him when he was damn near perfect. Uh, it was Kershaw that pulled himself out of the game because he's got a short shoulder. And going into the All-Star break here, there I'd be shocked if they don't put him on the DL. Um, so for by most accounts across the industry, nearly everybody's got Michael Grove projected uh, outside of you know just a couple of spots here or there. So it's it's mostly Michael Grove. That's probably who it would be. They might pull some. You know, Dave Roberts shenanigans. They might open like a Bruce Art Gratterall or something and then bring in Michael Grove afterward as the long reliever, which would probably be a good idea here against the Pirates because if they leave Michael Grove in to see all of these left-handed hitters two and three times through the lineup, uh, he's probably going to get blasted. 383 average allowed to the lefties with a 465 Woba this season so far, 235 ISO, 13% strikeout rate, 13% walk rate, no thank you and a 39% hard contact rate. Now, we had a short sample, yes, but all of those figures are probably, unless they start to change drastically, they're not going to bring this 2-0 homer per 9 number down against left-handers. So, he's super attackable with lefties, and the Pirates just got their best left-handed hitter back in Brian Reynolds yesterday. He's 4,800, so you got to pay for that. But Sawinski and Carlos Santana, Tuki Marcano are cheap from the left side of the plate. You can play a couple of these righties as well, because it's not like Michael Grove hasn't given it up there. Less so in the average, 258 there, 325 Wova. That's much better because he's got a slider. But for all intents and purposes, he's only a two-pitch guy here with a four-seamer slider. We just talked about that with Joe Ryan. you got to have more than two pitches to be an equitable starter in the big leagues. You cannot, you, you just can't get away with two unless you're DeGrom uh, and you have you know, 103. Michael Rowe certainly does not have that type of velocity, um, and he's only got about six, seven mile an hour velo delta on any changeup that he might throw as like a show me pitch, you know. So it's it's four seamer slider mostly, and um, you know, unfortunately, I'm missing somehow a a bunch of like 17 percent of usage here. I don't know what the hell's going on. So I think I got an error in the data. Um, so I have to keep an eye out for that. But no matter what the the third pitch is here you know he's still only got a 10 percent swing strike rate he's not inducing swing and miss and i think that's what you're going to need against pirates here because they only strike out at an average 22 and a half percent clip they don't create a lot but as i mentioned they did just get their best left-handed hitter back in brian reynolds so they're a little sneaky dangerous even though their numbers in aggregate are just average it would put michael grove in play at 5300 against an average offense but pittsburgh tonight is popping really hard in value not necessarily just because they're cheap. They are cheap, but this is also a fine fundamental spot because Michael Grove's been getting picked apart really terribly, um, and it's mostly by left-handers. You know, he's been overall pretty serviceable, even though he's getting on the barrel a little bit occasionally, hanging a slider, right? Or, you know, look at this, two and a half outs to the field that he's giving up um, on the four-seamer itself here. That is not good. So, we got to be careful with Michael Grove here and eating a lot of ownership on him at 15%. I certainly don't want to get north of this. Uh, I'd much rather pivot it to, I mean, shit, I don't know, like uh, an Alex or an Austin Cox or even an Jaime Barilla, for example. Um, you know, in 
bad matchups themselves. But I don't know. I kind of like the Pirates here a little bit, fundamentally going after Michael Grove. If they do open a Bruce Dark Gratterall, that takes me off of the Pirates significantly. And I think Michael Grove could then be in play because that would reduce his ownership. It will reduce his projection, of course, but it would reduce his, his ownership commensurately, and you'd get him, you know, 5 6 8% or something like that, which would be serviceable. He could run five innings, six innings there, and he could be in line for the win because he's, you know, this is still the Dodgers that are hitting behind him. He could very well get some run support. So everybody, once again, pretty much in play here. Um, favorites, I mean, it's got to be just the Dodgers, I guess, but I don't know. It's probably the Pirates uh, against Michael Grove, then the Dodgers, just because it's the Dodgers. But I think Mitch Keller is very much in play, and then Michael Grove lasts for me. But uh, I think everybody, really top to bottom, you know, in play to a certain degree. Okay, we kept it a little bit short. Let's go over a review quickly here. Baltimore and the Yankees, I like offense in this game mostly, uh, but I do think that Tyler Wells is very much in play. I like this matchup for him, even though he gives up homers. Uh, and same thing with Domingo Herman. I'm less bullish on Domingo Herman tonight, you know, certainly than I was against Oakland, right? Um, because, well, number one, he's not going to throw another per perfect game. I can go out on a limb and be pretty confident in, in projecting that. Um uh, but both of these guys give up power, and this is Yankee Stadium. You know, like, you can hit it out with a freaking golf club here. Uh, you know, hit a baseball out with a golf club. It's it's that small a field. But everybody pretty much in play. Yankees, if I had to choose a stack because of the price tags, but fundamentally, if I got to choose a stack, it's Baltimore because they're better. And I don't trust Domingo Herman nearly as much as I trust Tyler Wells, even though Tyler Wells gives up a little bit more power. But as you can see, I'm, like, hopping to all sides of the fence here. Um with everybody. So everybody is really in play. Atlanta and Cleveland, Bryce Elder. I'm probably going to leave a lot of my Elder exposure on the shelf. You could still get leverage by getting 10% of the field or 10% to the field here versus their 5% or 6% or whatever he's coming in at. However, I mean, this is a difficult matchup, man. I've got upside concerns for him at the ownership. It does put him in play, but he's going to have to run deep into a game because the strikeouts are certainly not going to be there. And this is a far more difficult matchup than it would seem I think on paper, um, you know, he's got a high ground ball rate, but, you know, pretty drastic platoon splits here. And I, I'm still looking for a lot more Bryce Elder regression. Gavin Williams, no thanks. I'm just going to leave him on the shelf. Uh, I don't really want to deal with it against Atlanta. Like, they just beat you every damn night, and it's insanely frustrating. So, I mean, tonight's probably the night where they, they shit the bed. Um, it could very well happen. You know, this is not 95 degrees in Atlanta. It's 75 degrees in Cleveland, so pretty big ballpark shift for them here. Um, does that really put Gavin Williams in play? I mean, I, I guess 6,300, he's got to be in play, but like this is a majorly dangerous spot here. You can actually make top five stacks of all the Atlanta Braves happen if you punt everybody else. So it's it's a viable construction if you can make it work. Um, Kansas City and Minnesota here. Austin Cox, I think, is in play at 5,000. Joe Ryan, absolutely in play. Minnesota, for sure. You can go after Austin Cox. He's probably only going get, to gonna get about three innings here. And we saw Cleveland even hung four on him uh, in his last outing. He did walk four batters there, though, so that's probably unlikely to persist against Minnesota. They're not a very patient team. They strike out a shitload. So that's going to be a little difficult. Um, you know, to get super bullish, outsized leverage on the field with Minnesota stacks. They'll be the most popular team today. So you got to balance that. And you're not fooling anybody with correlated Joe Ryan and Minnesota teams today, um, really at all. It's a fine fundamental spot, but it's mostly the price tags here that are popping the ownership for Minnesota and because they get a lefty and they're going to platoon heavily. But I think you can get a lot of leverage playing Austin Cox on the other side. I'm going to leave... Outside of just one-off pieces, Bobby Witt, Salvi, maybe a cheap Mikel Garcia or something, Nick Prado, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to leave, for the most part, Kansas City you know, off my board today. I don't want to go after Joe Ryan. I want to play a lot of him. Angel San Diego, Jaime Berea, he's in play at the price tag against San Diego. You're going to need to make some gulpy decisions. It's a six-game slate. And to play you know, really contrarian builds, you're going to have to do some crazy stuff here. Blake Snell, yeah, sure, but he's got to be able to throw strike one, and now we're starting to get into ownership territory, you know, on a short slate where you take a lot of risk with this kid, man. 75% strike one for him is not sustainable. It is over a short little spurt, like he's seen over his last six starts, but not long term. We've got, what, eight seasons of him 
you're throwing 55% strike one with a 12% walk rate. So you got to be very careful with this when you start eating 50% of your teams and chasing what I think could be a very trappy price tag at 8,600 for Blake Snell tonight. I love the changes, but this is a super dangerous matchup against a, a, the Angels. I think you can stack the Angels here and, and go after Blake Snell and get a lot of leverage on the field if it works. Uh, San Diego, for sure. Yeah, go after Jaime Berea, too. Um, they're kind of a, a middling stack. They're a bit more attainable than Atlanta and, and the Dodgers, but they're just as potent. Um, you know, not as good, obviously, but uh, they're certainly in play. Soto at 54, 5,600. Uh, you know, that's a pretty damn good price tag, I think. Corona work I like as well at 42. Um, okay, Seattle and San Francisco. Brian Wu, mostly pitching here for me. Certainly from him and for Logan Webb as well. I'm going to probably leave offense mostly on the shelf. I don't like the ballpark. I don't like the weather relative to some of these other games. I don't think the spots are all that good either. So um, I think the price tags are playable, and I think the ownership numbers make a good bit of sense here. So I think that's fine to get some pretty decent exposure here uh, in this game. Pittsburgh and the Dodgers, I think everybody is once again in play. Michael Grove, it's a little more variant for how he would be in play. Mitch Keller, well, he gets Dodgers, so that's a little tougher there too, but... Um, you know, I would probably side with Pittsburgh here, I think, as I just mentioned, and then the Dodgers, then Butch Keller, then Grove, but literally everybody is in play here to one degree or another here tonight. So sorry about the first video, guys. Um, we'll try and get this up ASAP. Good luck to everybody on today's Six Gamer. Keep an eye out once again for projections and ownership pushes throughout the day. Good luck.